December 14th of 2021. This is the Stoughton City Council meeting. And at this point, we'll take the roll call. Good evening. We'll start out with Caravello. Here. Doom. Here. Hiley. Here. Hirsch. Here. Jensen. Oh, he's muted. Jensen. Yeah, here. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Lagaki. Absent and excused. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Mayaski. Here. Reeves. Here. Hunt. Here. Schumacher. Schumacher. Oh. He should be joining us. Okay. Uh, Tekalski. Here. And I have the uh, Venegas absent and excused. All right. Schumacher has arrived. So, all right. Um, the minutes and reports are in the packet. Um, the next item up is public comment period. And we have one person signed up to speak. And you get uh, three minutes. Uh, to address the city council. And uh, Kristen Friedel is uh, signed up to speak. So the floor is yours, Kristen. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. All right, fantastic. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kristen Friedel. I am a Stoughton resident and I'm one of the homeowners at 324 North Madison. The other homeowner is my husband, Jamin, who I think most of you probably know, and I'm going to do my best not to embarrass him too much here tonight. Um, so I wanted to um, speak with you guys tonight to discuss the impact of uh, an ordinance that you're going to be talking about and voting on tonight. It's um, proposed ordinance 02621, and it would designate the west side only of one block of North Madison Street as a year round at all times, no parking zone. It's just the single block between Roy and Prospect on North Madison, just on the one side. So just to give you the lay of the land, there are actually only two homes on the west side of this block that face Madison Street, um, our house at 324 and the neighboring duplex um, who has driveways along each side of the duplex accessible from Madison Street. Our driveway, unfortunately, is actually around the corner on Roy Avenue, where we have a detached garage and a path through our backyard up to our back door. Um, Jamin and I have two small children, one of whom just walked up to make a guest appearance, um, who are three and five. Um, and so we typically access our home through the front door, um, provided that we're not in a snow emergency. We just park there um, basically because it's easier and more convenient hauling in two little kids and their backpacks and their coats and boots and lunch boxes. It's just easier to go in through the front. Um, so if the west side of the street becomes a no parking zone, we're going to be hauling small kids and all their attendant gear across the street on a, a block where honestly speeding is a problem um, and in rainy, icy conditions, et cetera. So um, we find that actually having cars parked on both sides of the street tends to kind of naturally slow down some of the speeding that we see on the block. Um, my understanding of the reasoning behind the proposed ordinance is that there's been some difficulty during past winters with the plows being able to get through. And I completely appreciate the plows have to be able to pass. That's a public safety issue. But that's a seasonal problem, and it's not necessary to create a year-round solution for it, particularly if it inconveniences the people who live in our neighborhood. Um, furthermore, I, I would submit to you that the ordinance is redundant. We have a solution to this problem. Drivers who park on the wrong side of the street during a snow emergency can and should be ticketed. And hopefully with enough tickets, some learning will begin to take place and they'll start parking where they're intended to park. Um, so I would just ask you to consider um, the impact of the, of the proposed ordinance on the people who live on the, our very small little block here. And um, I would look for you to vote no on that. So thank you for taking the time to listen to our concerns and I hope you have a great night and a very happy holiday. Thank you. Next item is communications and presentations. Are there any communications from council members before we go into the presentations? Uh, 
All right, hearing none, uh, the first presentation is from uh, Brett Abair, the Public Works Director. He's gonna talk about something we don't like to talk about, and that's snow. I think snow is a four letter word. Anyway. Not this year so far, but we're <laughs> we seem to be doing okay. I wanna thank uh, Alder Schumacher for dressing for the occasion. I appreciate that. Um, so oh, I'm gonna, <laughs> so I'm gonna go through our, our snowplow operations just so uh, you as a count, council and those that are watching have a better understanding of what we do uh, during snow and ice operations. Uh, if you have any questions as I go through the presentation, please uh, ask and uh, I'll answer them the best I, best I can. Um, so basically in the city of Stone, we have 120 plus lane miles of roadways. Uh, we have eight residential uh, plow routes. We also have a downtown plow route. Uh, we have two cul-de-sac routes. Uh, we have walking paths that our park staff um, takes care of. We also have 10 parking lots. When I say 36 cul-de-sacs, I mean 37. We have a, another one we added this, this last year being able to work. Um, so what we do is we break down our, our operation to our, our main plow routes and then our secondary routes. Uh, so our, our main routes is the things, the, the uh, roadways that we wanna keep open uh, during the storm. So we can get emergency vehicles to where they need to go uh, during a storm. Um, this is not to keep roads open for people to go to the grocery store. This is just so that we can get emergency vehicles uh, throughout town our, in our major arterials. Uh, we usually bring in about a skeleton crew of, of staff, usually two to four, uh, to keep things open. Uh, keep in mind, these are also the staff that plow a normal route, so we can't burn them out before we bring them in on the backside of the storm. So we gotta be very careful in how we utilize the staff. Um, typically, we take care of our, our schools as well, uh, the hospital, uh, churches on, on Sundays. Um, also, the, you know, the, we do pay attention to the school schedule. Uh, if they have a, a basketball game or a wrestling meet or something like that, we do uh, try to accommodate the best we can to get people uh, to and from school safely. Um, our residential routes, as I mentioned, we have eight routes. Uh, we typically plow curb to curb during a, an event. Uh, we salt uh, as needed. Uh, typically in the intersections and then mid block, uh, paying special attention to our inclines. Um, typically on a normal snow, I, I shouldn't say normal, nothing's normal about snow, uh, but it takes us around seven, eight hours to, to plow the entire city, uh, which is, believe it or not, pretty good uh, compared to other municipalities around us. Um, we do have two cul de sac routes, there's a 37 there. So we did a couple of years ago is we put our, our loaders into the cul-de-sacs instead of bringing our large trucks into the cul-de-sacs. And this saves us roughly 10 to, to 20 minutes per cul-de-sac by doing this. Uh, so that equates to you know, roughly you know, saving a whole route. Um, and so also bringing our, our large trucks into cul-de-sacs is, is incredibly inefficient and it creates more wear and tear on those trucks because uh, of the turning. Um, and so keeping those trucks going straight is, is where we need to be to create that efficiency. Uh, downtown cleanup, what a lot of people may not know or appreciate is that after a snow event, that next day, our staff has to come in overnight and remove the snow from the downtown area. You know, typically this is a, a larger snow event, you know, three plus inches uh, that they'll come in and, and remove the snow. Um, so this is, you know, after plowing all night, the night before, they come in the next night and plow downtown. Um, the reason why we do downtown is because there's no terrace for snow storage, uh, limited parking, and of course, we want to get these businesses open as quickly as possible. Uh, parks. Uh, the park staff um, mainly consists of our, our parks uh, maintenance supervisor, then seasonal staff. Uh, they, they remove snow and ice from all city-owned buildings, uh, city-owned sidewalks and paved trails, which is about 50 diff 56 different segments uh, on, your, on your screens, the, uh, the blue segments on the right-hand side. Um, parking lots, and this, this is a critical operation because if we don't do this, this could leave us uh, 
uh, subject to uh, liability issues. If we have any slips, trips, or falls that uh, we didn't take care of, of our end. Uh, there's also an ordinance against, uh, you know, remove any slippery surfaces within 48 hours. We surpassed that um, by about 24 hours. Uh, so our goal is to get everything opened up within 24 hours after a snowfall. Salty and, and pre-winning operations. Um, this is a big deal for us. Um, obviously, uh, we know that any salt that we put down is gonna end up in the Ahara or potentially in our, our watershed or our drinking water, I should say. Uh, so we do calibrate each truck. Uh, we can dial them down if we don't need to use as much salt, depending on the, the conditions, or we can dial them up as needed. Um, all of our staff has been trained um, to reduce uh, the amount of salt that we use. They've all been through the uh, SaltWise program. Uh, it's a statewide program that, that, uh, that was developed to teach operators how to uh, reduce the amount of salt that they use, uh, really to get in that mindset of reducing that, that salt usage. Um, and the biggest thing is you know, that they, they understand that, like I mentioned, all the salt that they put down, it doesn't go away. Those chlorides stay there in our environment and so that we need to be really judicious on how we use it. Uh, we also use, use pre-wetting on the trucks. While the cell is pre-wetting to reduce that scatter uh, when we drop it and it stays in the center of the, the roadway, it doesn't bounce off to the side of the road. Um, by pre-wetting it also helps to activate the salt a, a little bit quicker. Uh, so the graph here shows that you know, by pre-wetting about 78% of the salt uh, stays where it should be. Uh, this next slide just shows our, our ordinance. Uh, so basically, if we have three inches or more um, snow forecast that I can call a, a snow emergency, and basically that means that uh, cars must, must park on either side of the road, uh, depending on the, uh, their address um, after midnight. So that's the thing that people have to remember, it's at midnight is when that triggers that, that snow emergency. So at midnight, if it's an, an even uh, number, they need to be on the uh, even side. So um, the thing is with our snow emergencies, it's midnight to eight and that's it. We can't deviate from those times, which causes us some issues. Uh, as Ms. Friedel had mentioned, um, if there's cars parked you know, side by side and you can't get through, and it's not between that midnight to 8 a.m. period, there's no snow, snow emergency. So they have every right to park there. Uh, we do have the right to, to tow if they do not remove their, their car within 24 hours. Um, and that has been, been, been done before. Um, so to notify the public of a snow emergency, we do have uh, many different outlets that we try to utilize. Uh, we do have an email uh, sign up notification uh, that's on our website. If, if folks would like to do that, you can click on a link. Uh, we also advertise with various TV stations, a lot of the Madison stations, uh, regional radio stations, uh, the official city Facebook page, um, and then also our uh, city website. So the many challenges that we face is park cars. Um, some of the narrower streets really cause us uh, many issues uh, when getting trying to get through there. Um, our trucks are all equipped with wings, so that makes them uh, awfully wide. Uh, these, these plows that we, we run are, are 12 foot plows as well. Um, so it's, it makes it awfully tough to get through, especially uh, in the heart of winter, excuse me, after we have a few snowfalls and that curb line starts to, to shrink towards the middle of the road, um, it can cause us some issues getting through and, and getting things plowed for the residents. Uh, another challenge is, as you can see in the photo, uh, we do have residents that uh, blow snow into the roadway. Um, even after we go through, they blow it back onto the roadway, which is against their city ordinances, but they, they do it anyways. Uh, we try not to uh, put snow into on the sidewalks. However, with some smaller terraces, that's unavoidable. Uh, we do try to roll it up on the, the terrace as much as we can. However, we have to also keep our momentum going. Uh, we, we roll at about 12 to 15 miles per hour. 
uh, we have to keep that momentum to, to get the keep the trucks moving and push that snow off to the side. Uh, we also have an issue sometimes it's getting better with our contractors pushing snow in the roadway uh, after they, they clear private uh, parking lots or, or, or uh, sidewalks or driveways. I will say that it's getting better. I think we have a better working relationship with our, our contractors, uh, but it is still an ongoing issue that we deal with. Garbage cans in the roadway. Uh, this, this is an issue uh, on, on garbage day, obviously. Uh, so we ask that residents uh, shovel an area on their terrace to put their, their trash cans or put them in the driveway uh, off the roadway. Uh, because if we come through, we have to go around those, those trash cans and we can't get to the curb. And so that, that uh, uh, defeats the purpose of why we're there. We want to clear the whole roadway, but so keeping those trash cans off the road is, is imperative. Mailboxes, uh, from time to time we do hit them. It, it's, uh, it does happen. Um, however, uh, the mailboxes need to be uh, installed correctly. Uh, the United States Postal Service guidelines. Um, also, they, they cannot be in disrepair. Uh, so they need to make sure that the posts are not rotten. Um, and, and if they are rotten, basically we don't uh, replace them. If they're, if they're in disrepair, there is a, a seniority that uh, speaks to that as well. And if we do hit one, we own up to it and we will replace it. Another challenge is, you know, as we continue to grow, Obviously, that's more lane miles that we need to, to keep up with. And so uh, steady growth is, is good. However, we need to be cognizant that we need to keep up with staffing levels, uh, equipment as we, as we do continue to grow. Um, currently, we have all of our public work staff that are assigned a, a route. Um, I even hop in a truck when, when need be. Um, the only person that, that doesn't, that it may start, is, is our administrative assistant. So it's, it's really all hands on deck when we have a, a snow event. So we have no alternates. So if somebody gets sick or, or somebody uh, does practically take vacation, we don't we try not to allow vacations during the winter, but you know, if there's something that, that's going on that's family related, we try to honor that. Um, so if somebody is missing, we have to, to backfill that for our own staff and that it takes more time uh, for our operation to, to, get, to complete the, the plowing of the entire, in the entire city. Another issue is, is sleep deprivation. Um, obviously, when we have uh, multiple storms back to back to back, uh, that can really take a toll on our staff. Um, so, you know, we like to <laughs> we'd like to get in, get out as fast as we can to get some sleep. However, the storm is going to dictate what we do. And again, we have no alternates. We are we got we we have what we have. We try to manage time best we can. However, again, we can't dictate the weather. Um, and plow drivers are, are just doing their job. I mean, nobody likes it when it when it snows. Maybe the first one is exciting. Um, however, you know, folks just need to be patient. Um, our plows can't be everywhere all at once. I think that was a typo in, in yours, but on the screen, we, we you know we can't be everywhere. So folks may say, "Hey, you, it took four hours to get to our our uh, street." Well. We don't have enough staff or enough plow trucks to be on every street, you know, in, in, in an hour or half hour. So people need to be patient. We're going to get to you. Um, I, I think um, folks that came from somewhere else may appreciate that our timing, you know, we're, we're actually pretty good compared to, to others when it comes to completing our plow operations. Um, slow down, give us some space. We're just trying to do our, our job. Uh, these trucks are big. They're, they're very large. It's tough to see um, some of the blind spots. So just give us some, give us some room. Um, snow is gonna end up in, in driveway aprons. Uh, every year we get calls from residents wanting us to come shovel out their, their apron because we put snow there. Um, it's inevitable, the snow has to go somewhere. And also when we're done plowing for you know seven, eight hours, then we have to go home to our own driveway and shovel out our windrows. So we're not immune to that, that as well. Any questions from the group? That's all I have, Mayor. 
All right, thank you. No questions for Brett. Nope, just thank you and your staff for all that you do to keep our roads safe. Greatly appreciate it. Welcome. It might not snow this year either. We're, we're on the, the right track. We'll get it. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Um, the other communications is in your packet. We wanted everyone to know that um, the Depot Hill has been um, entered into the National Register of Historic Places. So I know there was work done um, by the Landmarks Commission. And then I think that the Redevelopment Authority also had some conversation about that as well. So we just put that in the packet for informational only. Are there any communications from council members? All right. Hearing none, uh, we'll move right into the agenda. And the uh, next item on the agenda is the uh, consent agenda. There's a number of items in there. Uh, at this point, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Hiley, a second by Reeves. Would anybody like anything acted on separately in the consent agenda? Hearing none, all in favor of the consent agenda say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, that motion does carry. All right, next item is um, Ordinance 23 of 2023 or 2021. I have problems with my screen right now. Let me do that, figure out what's going on here. All right. And this one here is coming from a second reading from Park and Rec Committee and the Finance Committee. Uh, all the person, Schumacher, you want to take a stab at this one? I will take a, a whirl at it. Um, Ordinance 23-2021. Um, hold on, I lost the lost my place here on the word in the ordinance. Ordinance 23-2021, repealing and recreating sections 66-1101 and 1 and 2, 67-3 and 67-5 of Stoughton Municipal Code relating to land dedication requirements, monies in lieu of land dedication and park impact fees. So moved. Second. Second, was that all the person do? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I can't see everybody on the screen right now. Uh, Alder person Schumacher, go ahead. Um, because this one's got multiple parts into it, uh, let's see. I don't know if Dan, Dan or Jamin wanted to talk about these because it's got multiple sections or multiple parts being redone in here. Yeah, it looks like uh, Director Glenn is available. Dan, if you need to screen, you can go ahead and take it. Um, I'm not going to rehash the presentation, but I'll I'll talk discuss a little bit what's changing. So, um, <clears> the <throat> first to start off with first, there's it's really just as the city expands, is to maintain what we're currently offering in the parks um, as far as the park land per 1,000 people um, that's needed. Also the infrastructure in the parks. And then there's also, um, if the dedication isn't fully, de or the land's not fully dedicated, there's a park fee in lieu of that developers have the option of paying. Um, and then finally, there's a new impact fee for trails. Uh, so um, the methodology is basically, you know, we did an inventory of all the park infrastructure. Um, and then, had a grand total, divided that by the active use parks, which are dedicated for developments, um, which are mini parks and neighborhood parks and sometimes community parks. And what we found out was like basically the parks, uh, 
or the cost standard to develop a, a park on per acre. And then, so we know how much land's getting dedicated for a development and you multiply that. And that's basically the impact fee um, total um, that, or that's needed to develop the park. And then we know the sense based on census data, we know how many people are in per, per household and it's divided, you know, <clears throat> um, um, by that cost standard per thousand people. So then you know what the, the actual dedication amount should be. Um, it's really, it, and it's really just to make it so that, you know, as the city park or city ex develops uh, new, their new, new developments come into play that uh, the, the current residents aren't paying for parks and, and, and developing new parks. And it's paid for by the developer um, through the impact fees and the parkland dedication. So if you guys have any questions, I can take them. Um, but it was just a lot of a lot of uh, gathering data on my part and then using the methodology that Baker Tilly had um, to develop everything. Yeah, and as I recall, some of the decisions were made based on changes in state law. And really the goal here, especially on the impact fees, is to make sure that when we're putting the amenities in the park, whether it's a shelter or playground equipment, there's enough impact fees to cover the cost of installing the, the appropriate items in the park. And we really don't have to include additional items for a new park and a CIP, which is something we've had to do in the past. So that's really kind of been the goal as we put this together. We're trying to, to balance the needs of the parks uh, versus you know the additional expense um, you know to homeowners or developers when the uh, pull the fee is typically or pull the permit is typically when the fee is is uh, collected for the building permit. So you know that's kind of what Dan tried to do here, and you know I think that we had consultants and city attorney staff working on this as well as the park and rec committee, and then ultimately through the finance committee. Is there anything from uh, Park and Rec that you want to add, uh, Alderperson Caravello? Um, I don't think so. I think Dan covered everything. Just want to make sure uh, we get the parks that we we need to get. All right. Any questions or comments? Um, regarding this one? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed, that motion carries. Uh, the next group is all the ordinances related uh, to the parking. These all came from public safety. These are second readings. Um, as requested, we did add um, some uh, narrative here to understand the rationale and then also some maps. And I believe if uh, Director Abair is still on here, so if you have any questions about that, we can either direct them to Brad or to Chief Leck as well. Um, so the first one, uh, Alderperson Jensen is Ordinance 24. Uh, yes, uh, Ordinance 24 of 2021, it's a, uh, let's see, discussion possible action, that's not right. Discuss, discussion and possible action on amending section 70-176, parent 50, regarding no parking on portions of Ridge Street. And I would move approval. Second. Second by Alderperson Reeves. Alderperson Jensen, go ahead. Yeah, this was um, our uh, October 27th meeting of public safety it was a 5 0 approval. And um, I guess I would let um, Director Haber or, or the Chief uh, speak to it. Sure, I can speak to this one a little bit. Um, so on your right hand side is, is Stone Hospital, and the arrows are is where the ambulance exits onto Ridge Street. 
And when you have cars parked at that dead end, it does cause some issues uh, with the ambulance um, getting through there, um, as well as in the winter months for snowplow operations, especially when we have to turn around at that dead end, we cannot go on to um, hospital property. So we do have to basically do a, a Y turn there. Um, that house on the south side, that's uh, basically the southeast side is no longer there. So there is no houses um, on the east side of, of Ridge Street. Um, so we think there is uh, very little impact um, in that area uh, to make this more of a, a safe area uh, for egress for the ambulance and for uh, snowplow operations. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments on this one from Alders? Tim? Excuse me, Tim? Uh, all the person, Hunt, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> I was wondering, have any of the uh, residents on Ridge Street spoken out against this planned no parking? That we're Not aware my knowledge. Okay. No, nope. the only communication I've seen is what we heard tonight regarding all of these ordinance changes. Okay. And I was just going to add, this is Lisa, this is in my neighborhood and the, there's the one house, well, this might not be the one we're talking about, but there's just, uh, there's really only one house now because the, the other house on Ridge, the hospital bought and it's sitting vacant. So I think if I'm correct, there's only one house that would be affected. Um, it is. does have a driveway, but I believe there's just the one house in this particular little block that is correct thank you for that any other questions or comments but just one more thing 025 speaks to the south side of the road so they, those are kind of uh, that, that same block so that the two ordinances the first one you just spoke to and then the second one coming up is that same block All right, hearing no further questions or comments, all in favor of this uh, motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That motion does carry. And the next one is ordinance 25 of 2021. And that also is coming from public safety, Alder Person Jensen. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, that's uh, Ordinance 25 2021, discussion of possible action on amending section 70 176, parent 84, regarding no parking on portions of Ridge Street. And I would move approval. Second. Second. I think it was all the person doom for the second. Yes. And any explanation on this one, the person Jensen? Uh, no, it was uh, public safety met um, October 27th and on a 5 0 vote, um, voted to approve or recommend approval. And uh, again, I would let, um, I think Director Heber pretty much touched on this already. So, but if he wants to add anything, I appreciate that. Yeah, just the reasoning for this one going all the way to Lynn Street is there is parking allowed um, in front of the residents on the north side, as you can see. Um, so going all the way to Lynn Street would create that opening uh, basically to, to Lynn. All right, any questions or comments on this? I'm sorry, did somebody have a question or comment? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 And any opposed? That motion does carry. Um, next one is ordinance 26 of 2021, all of Christian Jensen. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's Ordinance 26, 2021, discussion of possible action on amending Section 70-176, Parent 85, 
regarding no parking on portions of North Madison Street. And I would move for approval. And is there a second? Second. Second by Alderperson Sikowski. Alderperson Jensen. Yeah, again, this one was uh, on the 27th of October. Uh, public safety met and on a 5 0 vote uh, recommended approval. Uh, is this the one that we just had the woman talk about? Is there any way that you could just limit part, you know? Part of that to just the winter months, or does it have to be the full year? Yeah, if, if I could speak to that, if I may. Yeah, please do. I should be able to see the map, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I did in, in red include um, that for your consideration. Um, also, another thing to consider is move that to the east side of the road. So our, our thinking on the west side of the road where the line is, is that there was more opportunity for parking on the right hand, the east side of the road, because there is no driveways. However, Ms. Friedel, um, you know, spoke very eloquently about, you know, they, they have young children, if they need to uh, get them out of the car or on the groceries, they would like to do so um, at their carriage walk. Um, I guess our biggest concern is that this is a very narrow road at 28 feet and that during the middle of the winter as snow starts to build up along the curb line, curb line that the roadway does shrink. And so if folks are parked uh, next to each other or across from each other, I should say, uh, it makes it almost impossible to get through there um, at some sometimes. Um, and so I'm open to if, if you would entertain moving that to the east side of the road. Um, and then we could also discuss, you know, from November 1st through April 1st, which is typically our, our winter months. Is there any uh, disadvantages to go to the east side of the road? No, we, we were really trying to look out for the, the residences. And I'm glad Mrs. Ms. Friedel spoke up uh, because we were thinking that uh, on the east side, there's less driveways. So there's more opportunity for parking, uh, less obstructions. Uh, but understanding that, you know, unloading at on that side of the road at their carriage walk or their driveway uh, with the duplex uh, may be more advantageous for the residents of that block. We, we want to create the least amount of disruption, but also understand that we need to get through there. Emergency services need to get through there so that the less disruption we can create, you know, we're, we're all for that. I have a question. Yep. Go ahead. Um, so... To the north, to the north of this section that you want to uh, restrict parking on, does the street get wider? Uh, no. So, in the the thing with that is we've not had problems to the north. It's really coming off this Prospect and Jackson area that we've had the issues. So, so you're, it's not been a problem. You're, you're, your plows don't have a problem farther to the north on the same width of the street as you do it, there, the, which is the exact same width of the street. I'm not understanding why the rest of the road doesn't have that issue even though so the, i know you have an odd intersection but the intersection shouldn't take right. into be taken into account on this yep. with your so the, with your explanation so the, the parking issues have not been to the the north this is this where it's been brought to our attention as being issues in this block so you're penalizing people for using their street if we can't get through it, I'm not sure what else to, to do. I mean, we, we have to, to plow it. Emergency services have to get through. We're not trying to penalize anybody. We're just trying to gain access, not only for us, but for also the motoring public. It, it's been an issue in this one block particularly. I'm not aware of any issues to the, the north of this. Is the, I agree with you, Brett, because I walk this area a lot. This intersection is really bizarre. One, the, the stop sign is so far back on the North Madison Street that people coming from Jackson have a hard time actually even seeing a car there. Um, so, I mean, I guess it's, I don't know, I mean, 
from the stop sign forward, I would say no parking. And then, I mean, it's just bizarre. It's just a bizarre <laughs> road and intersection. So I don't mind moving it to the opposite side because it's actually only one property that is really on that whole other side that the majority of it, and they only have one driveway. And so they're not going to be parking on the street anyway. Um, yeah, it's, I'd be fine with that. And I mean, could we do both move it to the east side of the street and do the only from November to April 1st? And oh. is there something we can do about the stupid Sopstein being so far back? I think uh, I could speak to that. I think uh, it, all we need to do is an amendment, and I would, I, I'd be happy to to uh, uh, put that forward for you, uh, Regina. But the, the stop sign, I think that would be something that we would need to uh, uh, have a, a discussion in public safety, and and because that would be a different ordinance, I believe. Well, I totally agree. Yeah, uh, Greg, I wasn't planning on saying that with here. I'm just kind of as we're talking about this intersection just remarking that it is a really bizarre intersection. Yeah, yeah and just real, real quickly about the stop sign, it has everything to do with the alignment of this particular intersection. So if we move the stop sign forward, cars would be basically parked in the intersection. Uh, so it, it's not ideal anyway, we, we would do it. However, moving that, keep the stop sign where it is, keeps cars out of the intersection basically. The only problem is it creates a blind spot with the people on coming on Jackson from the west. They can't see the cars at that stop sign. Yeah, Regina, when when uh, when we discussed this in in uh, public safety, um, you know, I was looking at this. I don't think it it, it ever got fully discussed, but uh, it it. And like like you, I've walked this before too, and it, it's it's really a a puzzling intersection. It's like the one street just decided to uh, be further south than the other street. You know, it just it's a really weird situation right there. Um, but um, you know, I'm I again, I'm I'm happy to to move it from east to west. Um, I'm fine with uh, doing the uh, November first to April first. Um, but uh, you know anything else? I think it, it it it's it's so. Anything we do is is going to. It, it's not going to be a, a perfect solution. Um, it, so it, it's, it's before you all strange there. So, anyways, um, before you propose the amendment, I think uh, Chief Luck had some comments. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, reiterate what Brett was saying. It's not just for snow removal. I mean, when they're parking on both sides of the street, it is extremely narrow and it would be extremely difficult to get uh, fire and EMS apparatus through there um, on a regular basis. You know, it's, um, I, I, you're going to see this even um, more acute when we look at the, one of the other proposed ordinances down the road here. And that's really, <laughs> Uh, it may have been brought to the attention because of snow removal, but it has a little more impact than just snow removal. It, it definitely helps to maintain some openness in the roadway to allow, you know, uh, especially the big fire trucks and uh, EMS vehicles that have to transverse there. All right, thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments before uh, Alderperson Jensen gets the floor back? Well I guess I with that what the Chief Luck just said, would it would would he be okay with moving this to the east side for this street and only during November to April, or should we just move it to the east side and keep it always just on the east side with no um time limit? Well, I'm, I'm good either way, although I, I think it's, you know, I, I think that the issue does go further than just the snow removal time period. Um, but if if that's what the, the council wants to do is, is to, 
you know, restricted to that time frame, I, by far that is the worst time of the year to have problems there, especially as Brett said, when the snow starts to, to build up on both sides and that curb line really starts to extend out into the roadway. I've driven it many times in the, the winter time, uh, and I've, you know, it's, it's very tough to get through there once the snow, snow starts to accumulate on the curbs. If I could comment. Uh, uh, sure, you can have the floor back. Go ahead. Thank, thank you. Uh, listening to what Chief said and um, what, what Gina was adding in there, I, I, I think that um, the best way to do it would be simply to move it from east to west and leave it as full time. Um, and that would be the amendment that I would make is to move the uh, move it from the east side to the west side of uh, Madison Street, North Madison. Just one correction, if I may, it's, it would be from the west to the east side. Oh, okay, so I thought you were saying that it was the... Yeah, so that the red the red line is the, the west side that is in the proposal. So to moving it to the east oh, okay. side... It, I, it, I, was, I was looking, I was thinking it was the other way around. Okay, that's sorry, fine. Yep. Yep. Yeah, my okay. mistake. Is there a second to the amendment? Second. All right, second by Tukowski. So the the amendment would be to to change the proposed ordinance and make the uh, parking go from the west side to the east side. Are there any questions on that? I have one question about this. Go ahead. If I may is so if we're going to change this um this this proposed change should we kick this to the next meeting so that anybody that may potentially be impacted that might have thoughts about no parking on the <clears throat> east side is able to offer their comment or i don't know how people feel about that but since there's really only obviously Looks like one residence there, but just a thought. Bill, I think what we can do is is we can uh, vote on the amendment, and if it passes, then we could go ahead and just table this until the next meeting and give them the, the two weeks. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or comments on the amendment? <clears throat> Was the amendment for the entire year? Or just the winter season? Yes, it's permanent. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, all in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Anyone uh, opposed to the amendment? Okay, that motion carries. So that would take us back to the the original motion as amended. So we would open up the discussion on that. I, I think I heard one suggestion. Are yeah, there I'll, any others? I'll, I'll make that motion, Tim, to the table until the next meeting and so people can have another couple of weeks to take a look at it and see what All they right. think. Second. Question, will the, um, the residents of that block be notified then of this change? We, we could let them know. I think there's basically only one resident that would be would be affected. So, all right. So we'll notify them, and then uh, um, so all in favor of uh, the motion to table, say aye. 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 And any opposed? Okay, that motion is approved. Um, so the next one is uh, 27. So ordinance 27 and 28, I think, are on the same road. Alderperson Jensen. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, ordinance 27, 2021, discussion and possible action on amending section 70-176, parent 86, regarding no parking on portions of Hill Street. And I would move for approval. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Alderperson Doom and Alderperson Jensen. 
Yeah, again, uh, public safety met October 27th and approved this on a five to zero vote. And uh, we'll let um, the chief or Brett, uh, Director Haber, uh, add the, whatever comments they would like. Yeah, th this is much like the others that we had discussed, a very narrow roadway. Mm -hmm. um, during the winter months, the, the uh, snow is on the, the curb line and starts to encroach into the roadway and it creates uh, in a condition where we cannot get through with emergency services and also uh, plow trucks. Um, so this, this has been an issue for us in the past. That's why this is highlighted. Uh, we did choose this section on the west side because there is less impact on that side of the street. Um, and we feel that uh, that's, that is appropriate and up for your consideration. Any questions or comments on this one? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Oh, did somebody have a question? Sorry, I got an echo. Um, all in favor of this motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, the last one is Ordinance 28. Alder Person Jensen. Thank you. Uh, Ordinance 28, 2021, discussion of possible action on amending section 70 176, parent 87, regarding no parking on portions of Hill Street. And I move for approval. Second. Okay. Was that all the person Mayeski? Hunt. 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 I'm sorry. That's okay. All the person Hunt. Thank you. Um, all the person Jensen. Yeah. Um, same thing. 27th of October, and we uh, voted uh, five zero to uh, move for approval. And uh, I believe this is pretty much the same as all of the others. They're trying to. Um... Yeah, just just slightly different. If I can speak to it. Please. Sure. Um, uh, so on, on Broadway, as you'll see, and you can scroll down just a little bit more, uh, we're looking to restrict parking towards the intersection of uh, um, Broadway and, and Summit. And the reason for that is we cannot basically turn um, onto Broadway uh, from Summit because of cars parked here. Um, and so we're looking to restrict the parking just towards this intersection so we can make this turn. All right, any questions or comments on this one? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, that motion does carry. Um, next item, item number 12, is coming from the Finance Committee. All the person, Schumacher. All right, um, it doesn't, I don't think we had a resolution based on this, um, unless I am seeing something different. No, we did um, not, so you can just make a motion if you'd like. All right, so uh, the, the motion is to um, cease handling the, uh, the dog, the Dane County dog park permits. Um, these can be or are acquired currently in with the clerk, um, but can be acquired if they if they want to by um, Tabby and Jacks or I think there's maybe a veterinarian or two that might also handle these sorts of things. Um, when when they looked at the financial record for that of kind of what it costs as far as hours and that to process these these park permits, um, you know, it came up as as a pretty decent amount for the year. You know, about seven thousand five hundred dollars ish. Um, and we don't get, we don't receive any, any part of the fee for these permits. So that's ultimately uh, out of our pockets on that. Um, so I guess that was a really long winded motion, but the motion would be to stop 
uh, providing the having the clerk provide these service on this on these permits. And I move that. Is second. there a second? Uh, was it all the person okay. reads? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything, uh, Clerk Christian, you want to add at this point? This is your department. He, he covered that very well. Um, it's just, it's a very time consuming process. And um, I'm not quite sure that it's really something that uh, we need to keep offering as since it's offered online and so many other places. So I appreciate your consideration of this. Yeah, and I, I thought I heard you say at a previous meeting that we're like the only one doing this? Yes. Um, the city of Stoughton is the last uh, uh, municipality in regards to city size in Dane County that is doing this service. And I think part of what we'll do is, you know, we'll communicate some options. So if people still you know, want to be able to get the permits, um, they'll know where they can get them from, certainly. If somebody calls in or stops in, we can um, make that connection and, and, and we can post it on our sites as well. Correct. We're um, going to be uh, putting notice on the website and uh, also putting it onto our dog license application so they know that. So we, we will be noticing it as soon as possible. Any questions or comments from council members? Yeah, I have a comment. Uh, go ahead, Alderperson Jensen. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to say that I think that um, uh, Alderperson Schumacher is a brave person for uh, <laughs> his attire tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't wear that. <laughs> like I said, this is all month long and this is only mid month, so it gets worse from here on out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks you haven't the, seen the shiny the green pants yet. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for the joy and the cheer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any questions or comments related to the motion? Yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> um, here and none, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 And any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, next item is coming from Public Works. Alderperson Majewski, would you like to introduce this one? Not really. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, let's see, which one is this here? Oh, uh, okay, got it. R174. Yep. R174, acceptance of, acceptance of a sidewalk easement located at 125 Veterans Road. Public Works Committee recommended approval. November 18th, and this is a uh, an easement uh, right off of County Inn and Veterans Road for uh, sidewalk because of the uh, uh, utility poles are in the way and they had to go out of right of way in order to provide a sidewalk. So this is the easement to do that. All right, and that's your motion? That's the motion. Nice All right. Is there a second? I'll second. Call the person Hunt. Um, anything you want to add, Director Shield? Yeah, I would like to highlight uh, the screen. I think shows it very, very well. Um, as part of the Dane County Precinct reconstruction project, we were able to get them to install sidewalk where it did not exist on Veterans Road between. Um, the apartment complex to the south and 51. Um, in trying to attempt to fit that through there, you can see from the screen there's a lot of obstructions, um, but Dane County was willing to grant an easement and place the, the sidewalk on their property to accomplish that con connectivity. All right, any questions or comments from Alders? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 And any opposed? That motion does carry. The next one is uh, resolution 175 of 2021. 
And this is one that um, I think the Park and Rec Department in coordination with the planning department is working on. Um, we have a resolution here, but I don't think it went through a committee. Uh, Director Glenn, what would you like to do with this one? Sure, I, I can talk about it. Um, this is back in you know April 2019, we applied for a <clears throat> grant through the DNR for the Man Park RDA site pedestrian bridge. Um, and we were awarded the $134,458.79 uh, in the form of a land water conservation fund grant. Um, the, the, the DNR uh, applies on the behalf of the city to the National Park Service and there was some delay as far as processing the grant application due to the presidential administration turnover. So there is behind schedule, but um, you know, the resolution basically has some things laid out as far as when we have to expend the grant funds. And um, it's the other thing is that the area <clears throat> for the pedestrian bridge and the river walk uh, would be a, a section 6F property, which is just means that it needs, it's designated for public recreational use um, and it can't be a private thing. So it's everything that, you know, we plan on doing anyways down there. So I don't see that being an issue. Excuse me, but also 6F also means that if that bridge is ever abandoned and they wanted to use that land for anything else, you cannot unless uh, it is it is sold to it is sold and if when it is sold, then the city would have to find land of, of equal value and utility. So it, it shouldn't be an issue because Man Park's already a section six off property and then the it's just clearing it up. Okay. Yep. And then the other side of the the river on the RDA site, um, we have a you know the easement and perpetuity for the trail and the bridge. So it's the the resolution is just to accept the grant funds and move forward and then accepting the money. All right. Would somebody like to uh, make a motion to approve the resolution? Mayor, I'll make the motion to approve the resolution. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Caravello. Um, any more discussion on this one? Just one minor typo correction up in the header of it. Uh, your fiscal impact is 134 dot rather than a comma. Oh, up here? Just minor. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. We'll get that corrected. And as Dan mentioned, you know, this was delayed. Um, we'd hope to actually have this work done this year, but with the delay at the federal level, we weren't able to execute the work. We do think there'll be some efficiencies to do it uh, next year as part of some of the other work that's being scheduled. And I'd also like to thank uh, Director Friedel. He worked with, uh, uh, you know, to, to get some things extended because we did have an expense period that we, that came with the grant, but you know, there was additional paperwork that had to be done. So we're, we're in a good position to um, get things going here in the spring. So um, I know I'm excited about this project and I think others are as well, and you'll hear from them tonight. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed, that motion carries. Next item is coming from the plan commission um, for a first reading, Alderperson Caravello. Yes, this is ordinance 29 of 2022, approving a general development plan for the area known as the Stoughton Riverfront Redevelopment, Stoughton, Wisconsin. And is it the first reading or? Or do I move that we do this? Yep, it's the first reading. Uh, Director Friedel, do you want to start out and do introductions? I know you've been working real closely with this group. I, I think this would be more related to the zoning mayor. Uh, oh, I'm you... sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Rodney. I'll let you um, do that. I, I did notice one typo that it was probably my fault, but the file number actually is 029-2021. Um, 
as opposed to 2022. Um, but nonetheless, last night the, the plan commission held a public hearing on this rezoning request and recommended approval unanimously. You'll recognize the components in this ordinance um, accurately reflect and duplicate the application that the city council actually um, moved into the hearing process at a previous council meeting. So uh, you're probably quite familiar with the application and the ordinance does match what the conditions were and the ex exceptions that were outlined in the GDP application materials. Doug Hirsch and Kurt Brink are both online if there's specific questions. But you'll recall a little over a month ago, we had quite a discussion about the application materials uh, and this matches that discussion. Thank you. And uh, Kurt and your team, is there anything you wanted to present tonight or, or highlight in a discussion? No. Um... <laughs> no, there isn't. We're, we're just asking questions. Okay. I thought I heard you say there isn't really anything to highlight, but you know the the RDA and the Plan Commission and of course the Council have all been involved with this process um, to get it to this point. So it's it's been a long haul, but you know things are starting to come together. Yeah. Um, this will be on for the twenty eighth for approval. Are there any questions from Council members at this point? I just have a comment and, and maybe I need a clarification from older person Mayeski on this. I was just re reading everything um, again on um, with the exemptions and that was fine, but going back to what we had changed during the GDP aspect with respect to sustainability on page three of the Potter Larson, we did change um, for the initial buildings for the solar to be done in five years. And I thought we thought that was also going to be carried over for the um, other lots as well. And it still says 10 years. And I think it's just a typo, but maybe I misunderstood uh, the motion that um, Elder Majewski and uh, Vanegas put in, so it's page three of their memo. And I just wanted to make sure that we have that correct or yeah. maybe I'm just wrong. No, no, I think I think you're accurately reflecting on it. On page three of the exhibit, so actually page 28 of the document you're looking at, you'll see that's been changed to five years in the plan narrative. I believe okay. it's in exhibit B, page three of exhibit B, which is actually is page 28 of the overall document you're looking at, does show it as a five years after occupancy. Right, but the second, then it says second, then goes down as says oh, uh, being installed within 10 years for okay. subsequent buildings in lots two and three. I think it was all five years, but that's where I want to clarification because right now it says 10 years. I think you're correct. Uh, we can make that. I believe that it continues to be a typo. It was caught in the one spot, but not in the other. Okay. Yeah, and I apologize when I scroll down, the numbers aren't aligning, so I can't find the page right now. I would add one of the things that came up at Plan Commission last night. Um, there was a fair amount of discussion about landscape and trees in particular. And uh, Kurt and his team are going to take a look at um, this this trail that's going down here, and see if there is anything that can be done to modify that to accommodate some larger trees. And all the person Mayeski, you know, jump in here if if I'm not accurately describing that. Uh, yeah, there was. Well, first of all, um, I'm glad I could clear that up for you, Regina, about uh, the five year thing. Sorry. Uh, but um, yeah, no, that my my suggestion was that that they use more climax trees along uh, River Street, where you had uh, availability for open canopy and 
Uh, there was no reason not to. Uh, they were saying that they only have five foot wide terraces, which I have issues with in general. Um, and they were looking into uh, making them wider in spots to add more trees and possibly add some on the uh, the trail side of the of the street for the right of way. So that's something that uh, Doug Hirsch from Kurt's team is going to take a look at with with their uh, landscape engineer and hopefully they'll be able to modify and, and accommodate those suggestions. And then there was also some talk about the species. And I know that um, that Kurt's team is working uh, directly with uh, Director Abear's team on, on the exact species. And since all the person Mayaski chairs public works, he might have a little influence on that as well. Possibly. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, are there any other questions or comments from city council members? I think that was really the only thing that really came up at the plan commission last night. And our plan would be to bring this back on the 28th. We do intend on having a, a second meeting in December for this and then a couple other issues uh, related possibly to 51 West and and also uh, uh, utilities budget we're hoping to have on that agenda as well. So if, if somebody's gonna have difficulty making that meeting, let us know. Um, so this was just on for the first reading. So we'll go on to the next item. And the next couple items were coming from uh, Kettle Park West. And we've been asked to just uh, table these next two items um, so their attorney could have more time to review them. So we're not looking to take any action on um, resolution 176 or resolution 177. Uh, attorney Dragney, do we have to actually take any action or can we just pass over these? You don't have to do anything. All right, so then we won't. Um, so we'll go on to the last item here, which is R178. And this was one that was brought to our attention um, by the city attorney regarding um, a settlement that was made um, from some opioid manufacturers, I believe. And Matt, I'll just let you take it from here. Okay. Um, there are, there is uh, uh, what, what we're referring to as uh, some, some national opioid litigation pending in, uh, in uh, federal court. And there are settlement agreements that um, have been entered into that have not yet been approved by the court, but um, there is an opportunity for municipalities around the country to opt into those settlement agreements. And the city of Stoughton, I think received a notice from the Department of Justice indicating that it would have until January 2 to opt into the settlement agreement if it uh, wishes to do so. So we did some digging to try and understand better what, what uh, the city's options are here. <clears throat> and what we learned is that um, as a practical matter, because of legislation the Wisconsin legislature adopted, um, municipalities like the city of Stoughton are not in a position to be a direct recipient of settlement proceeds from, this, from these cases. Uh, the state has, the legislature has determined that um, if these settlements are approved, the proceeds would be divided between the state and uh, counties. And so by opting into the settlement, um, the city wouldn't really create any additional opportunity to receive any settlement proceeds. Um, the, the remaining potential benefit then to opting into the settlement is to in effect show support for the settlement, as I understand it, unless there's a critical mass of support for these settlements, um, the court, you know, it may may not uh, approve the settlements. So, 
um, if the city uh, uh, would like to provide a show of support for these settlements being approved, opting in is a way to do that, but it won't change the city's opportunity or eligibility to directly receive proceeds from the settlement. If the city choose, uh, is interested in uh, receiving settlement funds, then the way to do that would be to collaborate with Dane County um, and uh, work with Dane County to receive uh, funding for any opioid mitigation programs the city would like to undertake itself. The funds will be restricted to a use uh, for you know, specific opioid responses to the opioid crisis. And, and uh, we did have a brief discussion with the mayor about, um, you know, for example, whether a local nonprofit that might be interested in, um, in working on this issue might have the opportunity to receive funding. We don't know the answer to that yet, but that, that's not a time critical issue. So uh, from a longer term standpoint, the city and, and other local organizations should have the opportunity to work with the county if, if you choose to do so on local programs. Um, but the time sensitive issue is simply to decide whether to authorize opting into this uh, national multi-district litigation as a way of showing support uh, for the resolution of those cases and for the settlement terms. And so that's what the resolution would, <laughs> if the resolution included in the packet is adopted, then what we would do is essentially um, sign the city up as a as a participant uh, in in that litigation for purposes of uh, supporting the settlement. I'd be happy to answer any questions if I can. Hello, Kristen Hunt. I was wondering if we do sign up, would there be any likelihood we'd experience further expense to be a part of it? Not that we're aware of. And would there be more, a greater likelihood that we would receive funds by collaborating with the county? Not that we're aware of. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you can tell it's coming through the federal government. <laughs> Other person to Kowski. I just wondered if there are any other downsides. Um, I guess I would also just like to comment. I, you know, I'm, I'm generally, I don't see a reason not to support this. Um, I think some local organizations might have some creative ideas about how they can actually make a difference with this problem, either through offering uh, prescription lock boxes or, you know, a, there's a variety of things they might be able to suggest. But I don't know if, I guess I just wonder if there's some other downside that, to this. Again, we're not, we're not aware of a downside to the city opting in for purposes of um, expressing support for the settlement. Um, unless you're opposed to the settlement, I, I, one of the, you know, I, and it's a complicated case and there's a lot of money involved, of course. Um, one thing I do know is that, you know, the, there will be restrictions on how the funds can be used. And I think until the settlement is finalized and we see exactly what, how the money is uh, going to be uh, allocated, or well, how, how communities will be allowed to use the money, you know, it's a, it's a little hard for us to, to provide good answers about who, who would be able to use it and for what specific purposes. And I, but I think that's the next step of this. That will, there will be time to sort that out once this settlement is approved. Any other questions from council members? No, I, I think we should go. I mean, I would vote to go forward with this. I don't see a downside. And I, I think I'd like to send a message that, you know, what happened with opioids is unacceptable and there should be some repercussions and hopefully we can use the money to correct the wrong in our community. All right. So at this point, I I'm, I'm, would entertain a motion for the resolution. So move. Second. Motion by Tukowski, second by Hirsch. Any other questions or comments from anyone? 
Um, I'll just mention the fact that uh, these are settlements and uh, criminal proceedings are, in fact, a win for the uh, the people who are pushing these drugs from the top. Um, I'm not happy about that, but I don't have an objection to this part. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That motion does carry. And that's all we had on for tonight. No, actually, Mary, you forgot number 18. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped right over it. Thanks for uh, catching that. So yeah, number 18, this is something that uh, President Hirsch asked to put on the agenda um, for your consideration and kind of see where people are as far as whether you want to go back in person. Um, you know, you might remember that we do have a policy that allows a hybrid. So if you're not comfortable going in person, you certainly don't have to. I guess it just comes down to if you have a preference, if you want to wait, um, right now we're under the mask order until at least January 3rd. Um, so now is an opportunity to have a conversation. Um, I'm more than willing to do whatever you want. I don't want to be the only people, the only person in a meeting room, though, if everyone else is virtual. Um, I like to be amongst my friends. <laughs> I mean, I know there's a new variant out there, so I don't know what people's comfort level is. Um, in the council chamber, we would try to spread people out as best as we can and obviously wear masks. It'd just be nice to, I mean, I'm not pushing anybody. I'm just saying it'd be nice to have the council back together. I think it generates a lot more discussion a lot of times. And that's just my thought. Fred, have you ever even been in the council chamber? I have once, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was for court. Yeah, yeah. But I got out on, you know, good behavior. <laughs> All the person to Kowski. Yeah, I just want to say I'm I'm watching what's going to happen beyond January 3rd, um, and I don't know that it needs to affect anybody's choice here, but um, the Omicron virus looks pretty bad, and um, those of us who are all vaccinated can still contract the vi a virus, and so um, I'm I'm almost more reluctant than I was the last time we talked about this to you know, come in person, but um, a hybrid, if there are people who would like to have it, I think I'd be completely fine with that. Yeah, and we would just want to know if, if you want to do that so we can make sure we're, we're set up to do that. The other thing we could do is if there's not enough interest now, we could certainly leave this on as kind of a standing item on the agenda. And we can take a look at it at every meeting until you know things change. But we can also go hybrid if, if enough people really want to do it. I'm good either way. I say we wait. I would definitely like to see that option. All right. So I've heard Fred and Regina say they're good either way. I've heard Tom. Say he'd prefer to wait. Joyce would probably do hybrid. Anybody else? I'm good either way. I had a question. Um, I this is Lisa. So I I know that um, you know the opera house. You have to be vaccinated, but presumably we could not require people to be vaccinated since it's a public meeting, correct? If the public decided they would like to join the meeting or any other council members who may or may not be vaccinated, is that a slippery slope because it's a public place and public, public meeting? 
Um, yeah, Alder Reeves, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I, I suspect that attempting to implement a requirement uh, that people be vaccinated in order to attend a meeting would be would certainly be a, uh, present a, a significant issue. I I don't know. I haven't been asked to provide a legal opinion on that yet, so I don't know for certain what the answer is. But it would certainly be a um, a difficult uh, question to address. I think. Yeah, and I think the other question would be is if you decide to go in person you know, what will happen after January 3rd if, if the order expires? Certainly, you know, you'd have the option to continue to wear a mask, but we couldn't necessarily, I don't think, require anybody else to. Yeah, and I don't know, that might be another question for Matt. Yeah, again, I haven't been asked, I haven't been asked to render an opinion on that yet. I think you're in a stronger position to wear a mask than, a, than you are to, but enforcement is a challenge. Even, you know, you can, you can tell people to wear masks, but I mean, we've all seen people who don't wear them properly. And we know that um, this is a difficult issue for some people. This can be a, a point of contention. So, um, you know, I, I, I know that Sun Prairie, for example, they're, they're doing hybrid meetings but they're still not allowing the public into their um, council meetings, which is another interesting choice. Um, so it seems to me that it's, it's appropriate to consider these issues before you go back to either in-person or hybrid. Thinking about how to manage public participation is maybe the, the big and most difficult question. So out of the things that we just talked about, is there anything that this group would like Matt to do before the next meeting? Yeah, I guess it would be nice to know if we could create a resolution that if you attend a, a closed space um, meeting that you're vaccinated or you wear a mask, is that possible? I mean, it's a public safety health issue, and it may prohibit us from ever getting back together again <laughs> if we don't have something like that in place for at least a number of council members to feel okay about getting back together again. If and the council wants us to, to try and develop a, a response to that in terms of a legal opinion, we can certainly get started on that. Um, I, uh, I, I'm a little concerned that the answer at the end might be that the law is not clear on that because what the law requires is that meetings be reasonably accessible. And until we have litigation over it, the best I could give you would be my best judgment. But if the council wants us to give, the, give you our best judgment on it, we, we can do that. Well, if we're doing a hybrid anyway, so... You, it gives the public and council and staff options. You know, if if we chose, if you choose to be in person, you know, you have to be vaccinated and wear a mask. But if you that's not what you want to do, then you you can be virtual. Is that rule going to apply to council members as well? It already does. I mean, I would. I mean, yeah. we already have the resolution that it's hybrid. So, well, that, I mean, and that, yeah, would that would. It, I, I think you'd have to be consistent, probably. So, at least, I guess the question is, I'll, I'll look to the council. If you want us to dig into this, we will. I don't know if we can get an answer to you by your next meeting, but we can get started on it as soon as you tell us to get started on it. If. Does anybody else have any opinion? I mean, I'm just throwing something out there, so please chime in. I, I guess I have a comment. I, I really have struggled with the idea that we have a mandate and yet in public buildings, we have such a, an uncertain way to enforce it. So I, um, I've tried myself to do some research on that and see if, you know, what other people do. I, I haven't come up with anything yet, even at the CDC. It's not really clear, but there are some situations where there's a lot of vulnerable people. So I would think, especially then, but 
Um, yeah, I guess I would like to know more. I'm kind of baffled by that. Yeah, I'm a I'm a realist, so I would hate for you know the um, Matt and his group to spend a lot of time and resources on this, but I'd be interested to know. Um, even a conversation with Sun Prairie, I just, I mean, as much as I love the idea of everyone being compliant and vaccinated, um, it seems like a very slippery slope, not allowing the public to come in. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, but I don't, I don't know the realities of really getting, as you said, Matt, a, a firm answer that's going to make us all feel comfortable and confident. I think it may be that we, it may be come at your own risk sort of thing, which is what many of us are struggling with, I think. If I, if I could, uh, Go ahead. I'd like to, I'd like to ask the uh, attorney, uh, how is Sun Prairie getting away with this? So, I mean, it, it seems like if, if they're holding their meetings, is it because they're virtual as well? So there, there is the option for people to see and, and participate through virtual means, but then- Well, so the, the way they've approached it is, yes, uh, the public have the opportunity to appear or to attend meetings virtually. They also have in their policy created the opportunity for members of the public to, if they have a specific reason that they believe in-person attendance is needed for for the, for whatever reason there there's a there's an opportunity for someone to make that request and then it can be considered and and decided so it's not it, there is that kind of escape valve um to my knowledge um there's been no um well there's been no legal challenge to it um and i'm not aware that it's been contentious or the people have uh complained about it um so um but that's how it's set up hmm. right now okay anybody else have any thoughts it, i'm not really getting a strong feeling that everybody's quite ready i know there's a few that are i mean we could certainly do it with a few of us but it sounds like there's a few unanswered questions um, and, you know, I guess, I don't know if this is something we would take a vote on, Matt, or. Well, um, I, I guess I would, before I do a research project, evaluating whether we could, um, add a vaccination and mask and or masking requirement to, uh, people who wish to appear at a hybrid meeting in person, whether that be an elected official or. <clears throat> member of the public, I, I, I just, it, I guess it would be helpful to know that there's at least some consensus on the council that you, you're interested in the answers to those questions. If you, if there is, if there's a, at least a, at least a majority support for answering those questions, we're happy to do it. But if there's not really an interest in going in that direction, then it might not be worth the effort to, to do the analysis. I was hoping someone else had already done it. <laughs> it sounds like well, that's I, not the case. I, so I, I understand. I would start with the I would start with the league and just say, have you as a, are you aware of anyone else having done this? But I'm not. And I this is a I would be surprised if I hadn't heard of this. This has been kind of a big issue for everybody. So what are so most people are still doing virtually? I thought Madison was all all there. Um, well, I think I, I, I think in many parts of the state, you know, people are back to in person, no masks, you know, it's the Wild West. And <laughs> so here in here in Dane County, my, uh, you know, I'm seeing kind of a mix. Um, you know, the village of Oregon went back to in person, but now I think they might want to reconsider. Now people are getting a little concerned with this next with the Omicron variant. So it, there is no, there's no uh, clear trend in Dane County in terms of everyone going in one direction or another. Well, 
Well, okay, so for a little bit from Lisa and Joyce, uh, do we want to just bring this up in a month to see where this new variant is going? Or do we want to direct Matt um, to just start investigating with minimal you know, amount of time? I mean, what are people's thoughts? I would like to see Matt to go ahead and start the investigation because even if we delayed this until sometime after the after the new year to bring it up and discuss it again, um, we're going to need to know those answers. So I would uh, I would be in favor of Matt uh, pursuing that, uh, and then uh, we can uh, we can talk about it again. Uh, if not uh, the next meeting at the follow at the first meeting in January. How, how about this for a for a game plan? I can start by just trying to send out some questions to people in the municipal law world to find out what maybe there's something out there I don't know in terms of people having looked at this question of va uh, vaccination and mask requirements for meetings. Uh, we can also consider. Uh, I can also send an email to the uh, attorney general's office and see if they have any anything any guidance they can provide on these questions. And then I can report back at your next meeting what I found. Um, and that's pretty low cost. I'm just, you know, sending some inquiries out and seeing what I get back. And I'm not going beyond that at this stage. If that sounds reasonable, then I could do that. that very reasonable to me. Okay. I yeah, like that I approach, agree. Matt. Yeah, I would okay. agree. And, and it could be that what, you know, some of this may flush it self out based on the information that we find out from week to week. So that seems like a good plan to me. I would agree with to me. Plan. Let's do it before the rates go up. <laughs> <laughs> Get going, Matt. All right, that's what I'll do. All right. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else on this topic? No, nope, right. this is a good plan. I think we just need to wait this or you know, we gotta see what this one does for about the next two or three weeks here. We'll see what the holidays bring us. Yeah, won't we though? Sounds good. All right. So that's all we had for tonight. So the next meeting will be the 28th. So um we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Don't move. Second. Second, by Jensen, second by Hunt. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Have a good holiday. Happy yeah. holidays, everybody. Be safe. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.